Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 299, Sexual Harassment and Discrimination. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Today we're going to be talking about sexual harassment and discrimination. These are issues in our culture, in our society, at almost every level of experience. Uh, there is recently in the news uh, a rape story from Stanford University in California that a lot of people are upset and enraged about the way that mm -hmm. whole system occurred. But in reading about that, I've encountered research that says that uh, women who claim to be sexually harassed or assaulted, that only between 8 and 37% of those claims ever make it to trial. And in those mm -hmm. trials, only 5% of the men who perpetrate the assault or the harassment get sent to jail. So the system is really skewed in favor of protecting the abuser or the harasser and not uh, protecting the woman. And some of that is mechanical. Some of that is structural and legal. How do you prove something like that? But what we want to talk about is the culture of discrimination. We want to talk about it from two perspectives. One, the impact of the discrimination and the harassment on the female. And our focus is primarily on women who are harassed, not on men. It does happen to men, but it's rare. Uh, so, so what happens to the woman who is harassed in terms of her self-image, her courage, her ability to succeed? Uh, what does that cost her? And then secondly, within the system, why is it perpetuated? Why does it exist? It, you know, one of the statements that we often make about rape is that rape is not about sex. It's about power. Mm -hmm. It's about the assertion of power. Mm -hmm. And so we want to look at power within systems and how men in those positions of power mm -hmm. perpetuate themselves and perpetuate their power because they are enabled by the systems to do these things. They protect each other. They protect each other and they protect the system, you know, for the name of the school or the hospital or the army. Mm -hmm. We, we, lots of cover ups going on. There's about lots. That. So, so, so we thought we'd talk a little bit about it from a professional perspective mm -hmm. using medical training, medical schools, medical doctors. As you go through the process to become a doctor, one would assume at that level of education mm -hmm. and the intellect that people have to have, demonstrably have, in order to become physicians, mm -hmm. would you expect that that kind of abuse occurs statistically and, and in reality? And would you expect that women in those situations would put up with it? And whatever you expect, the reality, as you will hear today, is yes, it happens, and yes, women put up with it. And it's common. I mean, it's... And it's, it's common. It's common. It's even in women who are, you would think, women who are um, smart and rise to a level of, of power within an organization, like a hospital or uh, a teaching institution, like w for doctors that we would have been tough and been able to fend off any unusual kinds of uh, approaches or deals, trading sex for, for um, a grade, trading sex for um, a residency program, trading sex for whatever. But that has happened and does happen in, I think, it's... It was much more prevalent in the beginning of women becoming doctors in, in my field because that's when everybody was a guy and we were invading. And their response to that was, we can just lower them and or scare them and get them out of here. Many of the women in my class left. I mean, there were 13 of us, and seven of us graduated. And not because they couldn't cut it academically. Not no. because they couldn't learn. It was all emotional 
kind of leaving. And the stories behind that were basically they I had agree. had to do with uh, sexual harassment by of them by teachers, I mean, professors or other students. Or well, We did a podcast a, a couple months back in which we talked about the need for more doctors and the fact that mm -hmm. the medical schools are turning out doctors, mm -hmm. but the bottleneck is the residencies. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and not every doctor that is passing successfully their classes mm -hmm. is able to find a residence. That's true. And so if I'm in a position to make that determination and you've spent $400,000 going through medical school, mm -hmm. and you come to me and say, I really need to get this residency at this place, and there are 50 applicants. And I said, well, you know, there are some ways that we could ensure that your application is on top if you're willing to help us out with that. I know, and that's... And, that and sort that, of thing does happen. Yeah, I mean, I ran into that in college, you know, trying to get um, a loan to go to a Southern, well-respected university. That was my option. If I wanted to get a grant or a loan, so needless to say, I went to Mizzou. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that happens, and it happens. It used to happen more than it does now, thankfully. I th my daughter didn't have the same amount of issue in her class or to her personally as I did. So I think in any group of um, people where women are just entering the field, I think it's worse at the beginning. And as we, as Absolutely. we persevere and either, as you, you know, get more numbers in the community, it does start to it sway. It starts the to sway, but it takes forever. It does. It takes more than one generation. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it's not gone in my daughter's generation. It's just less, but, but that's, that's good. That's hope. But then what do we do when, when, I mean, what do women are, what are women supposed to do when they're harassed? I mean, basically. Well, let's be clear about that. I mean, harassment comes in many colors and many facets. Mm -hmm. It's not all just, we're going to have sex now. No. Uh, and, and it's actually, not all they, trading sex for power or trading no. sex for something. I mean, Sally Fields managed to get Forrest, uh, Tom Hanks into college that way. Uh, <laughs> if you remember the movie. Yeah. Uh, and those things do happen. Right. But, but the Journal of the AMA has right. has, has, has an, article. an article about this, and it has the four. Would you read it's the a, four? It, yeah, it says there are four? five. They, they ask people to self-report. They, they, they ask doctors who have been in practice for a number of years and have won awards for advancement in their career. So we're talking about the Male and successful female. doctors. Successful, already out in the field, already mm -hmm. working. Have you been subject to sexual harassment in your career? Were you subject to sexual harassment or abuse in your uh, med school? And 80% of the respondents that said yes were women. And uh, they, they ha had to rank their experience. And this is all self-reporting. This is not objective database stuff. This is self-reporting. I felt harassed or I felt abused. But 60% of the women that they asked that question right. of said yes. Yes. Well, And, then, and that's a huge percentage. Five categories. They said rank these and see if you had them. Generalized sexist remarks and behavior. So if you're in a classroom or if you're in a lab or if you're in a hospital room somewhere, a comment about somebody's body size, size or shape or looks or features, uh, posters on the wall that are inappropriate. And this is like, to me, that's like nothing compared to what I to saw. To what actually. Well, <laughs> that's I, like, that's like, I wouldn't even notice that because that was just so nothing compared to the overt harassment. Well, uh, one example I heard this morning in, in a discussion was the male doctors had a showering room. And mm -hmm. female doctors had to shower in the morgue mm -hmm. because they didn't want to build double facilities at double the cost for. And they wouldn't let the women into the men's holiday lounge. inn. Yeah. <laughs> and the men would have their meetings there too. Right. The men would go back and have their meetings. The The residents would have their meetings, all men, leaving the few women out. Right. And so, that was just a way of, that is, that is part of discrimination. Well, it's like in business when they have male-only golf clubs mm -hmm. where men go for business reasons and deduct it on their taxes and the citizens are paying for it. They're out there playing golf and making deals. Mm -hmm. And the women in the same business are shut out from that opportunity to make those deals. Many of so, those have clo have stopped doing that and take, started not taking all women. Of them, but, but in many. But in my early career, it was always the men that yeah. were the... the um, 
me, the men were the the members, and if they got divorced, the women they're gone, mm -hmm. and the next wife comes in. They just take over the other they take over the other locker. I mean, it was it was almost it's funny. To doctors married nurses, yeah, yeah. or other or doctors spend time with them, yeah. <laughs> So, in any case, in any case, that that kind but of sexual thing. harassment in that category, that first category, would be like, okay, Doctor Smith is retiring next week. We're going to have a party. You're the only female. You're the one who knows how to make uh, hors d'oeuvres and crap. <laughs> so you bring stuff in, and then we'll chip in a little money. You know, uh oh, it yeah. Happens. The the head of our residency <laughs> had served in Turkey at some point, and he loved belly dancers. And so they had me hire a belly dancer for him. You hired the belly me dancer. Me hire the belly, belly dancer. Go see if you can get a first-year med student. Who was, yeah, well, I was a resident, but that's okay. Yeah. But I hired the belly dancer. So, so I, I participated. Yeah, <laughs> in, in the abuse. The second category of self-reporting was inappropriate sexual advances. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does that look like? What does that mean? That, mean that, looks, that looks like. They inadvertently touch you. They that looks like, you, yeah, the guys are, you. you're at the operating table and they scoot up close to you and they grab your butt. Yeah. Or they grab your, your. And hope that you don't boobs. go, oops. <laughs> no, well, they're behind, you know, you're at the table. Yeah, but you're slicing and dicing. Right. And yeah, I mean, you ha basically when you're a surgeon, you can't notice anything that happens to you. <laughs> I mean, everything else, the world goes away. Sure. Except for right here, you have so hyper focus, huh? and yeah. no, and you're trained not to move. Yeah. I mean, if somebody bumps into you, you're trained to keep your hands still. Right. Right. So that doesn't bother so if the somebody patient. Somebody your butt, then but it bothers you mentally, it and it bothers you. I mean, that happens to like get somebody else out of the operating room so they could use it, or mm -hmm. to just just lower that person, if lower that woman down to a level below him. Yes. So, needless to say, I've never been grabbed by a, a woman, but I mean, but and many of the women I know have been grabbed by men in the operating room, mm -hmm. but also things... And of course, you've never grabbed any men in the operating room. Of course not. Of course not. Okay. No, I mean, no. That's a <laughs> no. Yuck. I mean... Yuck. <laughs> that would never happen. Have you seen some of those? No, guys? I mean, no, I just didn't mean that. I just mean, that's inappropriate. I would have found that... Yeah. Just yuck. <laughs> The third category, subtle bribery to engage in sexual behaviors, which is where you get, you know, like, okay, we've got 10 residents. They're all going to be moonlighting. We're, we're scheduling them in hospitals all over town. And there are preferred schedules and not preferred schedules, mm -hmm. preferred hospitals and not preferred Easy hospitals, hospitals quiet hospitals that pay like the same as the busy the, one. Uh, the primo slots, I can arrange that for you, but in return, I'm going to need a little something from you. Right. That happens. Yep. That happens. And that also in medical schools, it, it was it's a backhanded discrimination because if you if you were approached by a teaching physician or a, a resident and you're a medical student, so you're nothing, and they come up and they say, you know, I can make I can get you honors in this particular specialty, which me, would lead you into would open doors for you. Open doors for you in the, in the future if you just come to my call room and, you know, sleep with me. Both, usually both people were married. And, you know, and oftentimes the woman would say, I mean, I knew somebody who did this, said, said yes, and she would get honors. And I would say, absolutely not. And I would not get honors even though I was doing the majority of the work and sewing up. Faces and hands, which is a primo thing. If you're really good with your hands, they let you do that. So she never showed up for anything. But I was there doing the work, and I got nothing well, because I said no. Well, she did show up for some things. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, to me, I mean, she was participating in that. That's her problem. My problem was I got a ne I, it was negative for me because right. I said no. Because you said no. So then the fourth and fifth, the th fourth threats to engage in sexual behavior, and fifth, actual coercive advances. So these things were reported by women doctors mm -hmm. who are now in sexual successful careers like you mm -hmm. who are telling these stories. I, I had this happen to me or I had this situation that I'm aware of. I know this happened to someone else in my class 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Your doctor, uh, your daughter is now a physician mm -hmm. and she's just recently graduated mm -hmm. and you've had this conversation with her. Mm -hmm. Do these things still happen? 
did you experience anything like this in your training and residencies? And she tells you that some of this has changed, <clears throat> but does. some of it is still there. But I have a um, another family member who's in medical school at a different medical school. Okay. And she says that stuff happens all the time there still. Wow. So it's still out there. Right. And, you know, they, they have these guys go to sensitivity training and the guys laugh about it and they come back to the operating room and tell, you know, tell all of us how stupid that was and how they wasted their time. And, you know, and I just. It's one of those things that men don't get. I mean, I, we started this conversation by talking about. They the, get it. They know that they're lording their, their power over us and making us just nothing when they, they do that. They get the exercise of power. They don't get the sensitivity about the discrimination and the harassment. They, they, uh, many of them do not. I mean, yeah, I'm, the, I, yeah, I guess they, they're blind, but the, well, they think in it's, a way, they think it's, they have filters. That, they think it's their, their, they're the king of the jungle. They can do whatever they want. Or they think it's not that big a deal. I mean, when I was in practice, uh, counseling, dealing with families that someone had experienced sexual abuse in, occasionally the perpetrator would be called in to, to talk about that. And pretty consistently, their response was, I didn't do anything that bad. It wasn't really that much harm. It was only sex. And this person has had sex now a thousand times in their life. How can one time be different from others so traumatically, so badly? I'm not a bad person. And, you know, she made me do it anyway. Uh, she made me do it anyway. Well, that, that would be the argument. That they yeah, made. She seduced true. me. She's evil. She's wicked. She's sexy. And so it's not my fault. I'm the innocent guy that got manipulated. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty party That kind line. of rationale. Is what, we started this conversation. They talk about the rape case that's in the news uh, that happened out at Stanford. The father of the boy on trial, 20-year-old man, on trial gave testimony to the judge before the sentencing to say, please don't give him a harsh sentence. She said he's got 20 years of positive experience in his life. He's gone through Stanford University. He's an athlete. He's a good student, blah, blah, blah. You're going to destroy him for 20 minutes worth of action. He destroyed himself. I understand that. You understand that. The victim understands that and asks that it be considered in, in the sentencing. You know, he did this to me. Let's talk about what my experience has been. Let's talk about the way it makes me feel. She'll be on the couch forever. That can happen, and it has happened. People are so damaged that they never find a way around the damage, mm -hmm. especially when there's a betrayal of trust, uh, such as, as uh, incest within the family but or, or power. Or that, a teacher like a or teacher, somebody uh, trusted. A physician, uh, mm -hmm. a dentist, a priest. Mm -hmm. You know, th those are additional damages that occur above and beyond the physical experience. Mm -hmm. you, shame, harassment, self-doubt. Fear. Never trusting anyone again. Never trusting anyone. Uh, impacts on your relationships. All of these things can and frequently do happen to the person that was harassed. And so then at the end of the day, this judge considered all these comments and sentenced the guy uh, who had raped an unconscious woman found next to a dumpster. Uh, she passed out at a fraternity party and they'd haul her out and put her in the bushes by the dumpster. <laughs> and he came along and said, well, look what I found. And took advantage of her. <laughs> I didn't know that part. I thought he had put her out there. No. Oh. And and two passerbys who were riding bikes saw this, recognized that she was unconscious, mm -hmm. that she was not responding to what he was doing, but he was doing it anyway. And he ran away, and they chased him down and held him until the cops came. And his, his defense was, well, I, I'd been drinking. I'm not responsible. I didn't know what I was doing. And her statement is a really powerful statement about victimization, about what it's like to be the woman in that circumstance. And that's an extreme example. This woman was raped and now they have a conviction and he got, he got six months in jail for that. Uh, <laughs> that's because it was laughable. only 20 minutes worth of action. That's laughable. Well, the judge should be de well, taken off the bench. Well, there's actually a movement afoot to do that, but, but that's the extreme end of it. What if it doesn't go that far where you have an unconscious woman who's raped, but you have someone who has standing and status. I mean, mm -hmm. here's a medical student who who's worked their tail off to get there to get this opportunity. And now they're saying, well, wait a minute, there's one more door. It's a glass ceiling kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You have to, to, to get to the secret works, to get your diploma, to get your license, to be able to practice. You need to be a little more friendly than you are. 
You need to yeah. be understanding yeah. that this is your status in life. And you need to put up with this because we have the power. We control access to the mm -hmm. desired resources. Well, women used to be told that all the time. I mean, by whoever they complained to, which was even worse. If if they complained, which was infrequent because it didn't get you anywhere, if someone complained to the head of the department, the head of the department kind of went, suck it up. You're a big girl. Exactly like that. Right. It's go out only go out and work. It's right. only, you know, they're just being boys. That's the boys kind of Boys will stuff. be boys. That's yeah, a really but, useful statement. But there's so much stuff behind the scenes that scars these women that right. they find out later. Like... All the men are betting on who's going to bed them. Mm -hmm. Okay, who's get who? that's every time those men are looking at at that at that doctor. They're th the other doctors are men looking at hers. They're thinking, "Hmm, I wonder if he's gotten her yet." You know, they're not thinking about medicine. This is their this is their entertainment. She's a five. She's a nine. She's a two. Uh, uh, and, that's, and they let them hear that stuff. That's sexual harassment. Yes, it is. Even if it's behind their back and right. they they know nothing it about it. Is. But also when um, I was the only woman privy to this in a room of men where we had, we were looking at new residents for a program, you know, so we help vote mm -hmm. on who we like. They usually have come in and worked with us. And, you know, and so everybody who has liked one of these applicants stands up for them, that kind of thing. And so a male said, who I still know says, I don't think we should have any more women residents. All they do, they're not as smart as we are. All they do is get pregnant. Of course, I was pregnant at the time. Never miss a day of work. I'm in the room. Yeah. I'm sitting next to him. Yeah. He doesn't see me. Right. You know, and he starts in on all this and we need somebody for our basketball team. There you go. And I have. Primary's I, an higher doctor. Can they shoot a three point shot? I mean, I, I, I basically quietly lost it because I couldn't, I mean, you don't lose it in a room like that. I just stood up and when I stand up and he's sitting down, I'm eye to eye with him. Mm. So I, I, well, he's a basketball yeah. player. so I, I stood up and, and I said, <laughs> I'm out to here. Would you like to take this outside? <laughs> and he just looked at me and goes, Oh, I forgot you were here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't care if he forgot I was there, but the point is you they would have said that, that and he would exactly. think that way. And I outstripped him on every single test there was. So why would he even say that? It's just a lie. But lies are, you know, if you say them enough, they end up working for you. The big lie technique. Yeah. Hitler talked about it. Yeah. Uh, so finally, to say this has been a discussion using examples from med school and medical But training. it's everywhere. But it is everywhere. I mean... If you're alive at all, you have to be aware that there are issues in America's military, women who claim sexual harassment, sexual abuse, and rape, who have to report it up the chain of command, and the chain of command consistently protects the abusers, not the women. Mm -hmm. uh, General's Daughter, the movie General's Daughter. Yeah, the movie The General's mm -hmm. Daughter, exactly, uh, or the novel, mm -hmm. Nelson and DeMille. Movie. Yeah. It happens in schools. It happens in churches. It happens in hierarchical power-based systems everywhere. And so what we're hoping is that there will be a greater sensitivity, there will be more equity, there will be more awareness, and that fairness and justice will come to, into play more than it has to make these systems safer for our daughters and our wives. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.